I think we can get started. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the uh, state of the project session for the Aperio OE or the Aperio Open Academic Environment. Uh, we actually have a lot of cool stuff to show, I think, today. Uh, so this should be pretty good and hopefully keep you awake after lunch. Um, I'll say a little bit about what, what is the OE. Uh, for those of you that don't know the OE very well, uh, what, what does it try to do? What does it try to support? And basically, there's two answers there that I'm going to give today. There's the, the complete answer, the full answer, um, which goes along these lines is that it, it tries, the OE tries to offer support for academic collaboration and academic networking. And when I say academic collaboration, that can actually mean very many different things. Um, that can be as simple as just one-on-one, -on -one, um, one -on one sharing. It could be uh, small student groups. It could be research collaboration. It could be committee work. Um, it could be cross-institutional collaboration. It could be even entire communities of interest. And these are all examples of things that we've seen already. Um, and so it can take many forms and shapes. And, and we, we are pretty sure that there will be more. Referring back to yesterday's uh, keynote presentation, it, it will facilitate the unexpected. And we've already seen many sort of interesting, new, uh, innovative ways in which people are using the OE system. Um, and we're pretty sure that that will continue to happen. Now, there's also a short answer. And so having all of these options, all these things that it's trying to do, that can be a little bit overwhelming when you're trying to get started, when you're looking at it for the first time. Um, and I think, I mean, my short answer is try and use it for, uh, for project sites. It's something that we're probably, uh, that most of us are doing at our institution. Um, it's something that the OE is very well equipped for. It, it will give you a vastly superior uh, user experience over what you're already using at your institution. Um, and it's something that you can start doing today. Um, it's just, and we think it will be very successful. Quick word about uh, multi-tenancy. So OE is a multi-tenant system, and that basically, what that means is that a, a single installation of the OE can support multiple uh, universities or institutions at the same time. And the way in which that manifests itself is that every institution on that installation, they will get their own tenant, um, and with the tenant, that'll have their own, that'll have its own URL um, with its own set of users, the people at that institution. Uh, its own branding, its own skinning, uh, so it, it will very much look like a system uh, that's being provided by the institution. Now, the big advantage over this, other than economic, uh, than economic reasons, is that that actually allows for people to start sharing across institutions, to start collaborating across, in, across institutions in a very seamless way from, from a very safe environment. Um, and then when you actually zoom that out a little bit, this is where it becomes really interesting. This is where the real potential comes in. Um, if you zoom that out at the global level, you, this would actually allow for uh, this global community of, of institutions to be created where they can very seamlessly, uh, a person from Marist College could very seamlessly work together with a person, person from Cambridge, each from within a system that looks like it's their institutions. I think that's a very powerful concept. So I'll do a very quick demo today. Um, hopefully the, the internet will allow for it. Um, there's just, at, at previous conversations, I've done pretty complete demos of what, of what the OE offers. Um, at this point, there's just, there's just no way that we can, we can do that in a 45-minute session anymore, um, just because there's, there's a lot of things there to show. Uh, I will go in, I'll, I'll show some of the basic concepts, but there's a lot more for you to go, to go in and, go e and, and explore. So in this particular demo, we'll be working with two people. Um, and they can be anything you want. They can be researchers. They can be students. Uh, they could be academic staff at, at your institution. Um, this scenario will work for all of those. So we've got Natalie and Brad. Uh, and we'll quickly use the system as them. Um, in this one, I'll be using a, a demo environment, which you can just go to and, and play with if you want. stuff is working. Okay, so this is, so a little bit about multi-tenancy again. So how does this uh, manifest itself in reality? So basically, this is one, ins a, a demo installation that I'm, that I'm using now. There is one tenant here for the uh, University of the Open Academic Environment, which is a, um, just a demo thing. Um, on the same installation at a different URL uh, with a different set of users, different branding, different skinning, uh, we've got a tenant for the University of Cambridge as well. Um, and so the really exciting thing is that even though this looks like um, it's something provided by your institution um, and looks like it, and is actually a very safe 
uh, system to work in, it actually does allow for people from this one university to work with people from, uh, from, from Cambridge, as an example. So we'll go into, the, so this is the system's landing page. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about the sort of public, uh, public experience that the OE also possesses uh, in a second, but we'll first go in as one of our demo users, which is Natalie. Um, and so right now I'm using a, just a demo account, but OE natively integrates with things like, uh, like CAS and Shibboleth and so on. It can be, can be very easily, your tenant can very easily be configured to work with your single sign-on system uh, at your university. So we'll go in and say a little bit about this. So the, the way in which I look at the OEE is basically as a, um, as a golden triangle and you, with um, users or people on one side, groups on another side, and then content and discussions uh, on the third side. And basically all of these things, uh, they, can, they can interact with each other in a very, a very flexible way, a very seamless way. Um, so, so that means that people can be members of groups, uh, groups can be members of other groups, uh, uh, content and discussions can be shared with people, can be shared with groups, uh, people can follow people, and so on and so on. So, so that sort of creates a network of things almost. Uh, and in the middle of that triangle, there's, the, there's what we call activity, that's basically the, uh, that's what we consider to be the heartbeat of the system, that's actually what's going on in the system, what's being created, uh, what's being collaborated on. And so basically, so once we've signed in, we've, we've arrived at Natalie's personal space, and that personal space is very uh, reflective of this golden triangle, I think. So there's the, there's the activity at the top, uh, there's my library, which basically comes back to content and discussions, my groups, which is the groups, and then my network, which is the people side of the triangle. And so I'll go through these basic concepts a little bit more. There's actually a lot that you can do with, with these. Um, um, so let's start off with, we'll come back to recent activity in a bit. But let's go to the library. This is about content. Um, and when I say content, that can actually mean different things. So content can just be files that you upload into the system. It can be links to external resources. It can be collaborative documents, so documents that you can work on with multiple people at the same time. Um, and we all treat them fairly similarly. And a lot of the collaboration that happens in the OE as a system is through content collaboration. Um, so I'll go ahead and I'll, and there's, there's many use cases for this. So in this particular case, I'll just share something directly with Brad. Uh, maybe I want feedback from him. Uh, maybe we're working on a project together, just getting something started. Uh, maybe I told him that, I, that I'd get something to him. And there's just so many ways in which, you, uh, in which you could use this. So we'll go in there. And it has all of the, the modern things that you'd expect. Um, so let's do a PDF in this uh, image file. Let me say a little bit about this, about these permissions. Uh, so this is something that you'll find throughout the entire system and because, because it's trying to uh, support ac academic collaboration, this is actually very important. This tries to, um, tries to cater to the specific needs of academia. And basically anything in the system you do, you can decide um, if, you either want to make, if you either want it to be completely public, um, in which case everyone uh, will be able to find it and see it. Um, you can decide to limit it to your institution only, and in which case only people from your institution will be able to see, see it and get to it. Um, that is somewhat relevant to content, but when you think about something like groups, uh, having groups for your institution, maybe you want people to be able to, uh, to discover groups in your institutions, maybe certain types of interest groups, then it becomes really, really relevant and really powerful. Um, and then you can make things private as well, in which case only yourself and the people and groups that you explicitly share it with will be able to see it or get to it. Okay, um, and so in this particular case, I'll make it private. We're starting out with some very simple, basic collaboration, um, and I'll go ahead and I'll share it with, uh, with Brad. There's it. Okay, and so sharing you can do with both users and groups, uh, or even a mix of them uh, at the same time. So let's go ahead and do that. And you'll see that this updates and we'll try and tell you what's actually gonna happen. Um, and hopefully by now you'll, you'll have seen that we've tried to put a lot of time into, into the user experience of the system. We've tried to keep it as simple as possible. We've done a ton of testing um, and many design iterations uh, at, many, at many universities and many institutions all over the world. And so hopefully you'll be able to see that it is actually um, very intuitive and some of our early feedback from people uh, does seem to, seem to uh, confirm that. So go ahead and I'll update that. Upload that, sorry. 
So you can now see that those two items have been added to my library, and my library contains all of the content that's either been uh, created by me or has been shared with me directly. So that's my sort of, um, that's for when I'm working together with people directly, basically. Um, so let's go to, um, to this image, for example. So every content item in the system will have its own profile, uh, profile page, um, however you want to refer to it. And basically, um, and basically every content item will have its own metadata, will have its own uh, permissions, its own visibility settings, or can have its own visibility settings. Um, every, all content items are versioned, so you can always go back through time, uh, go through all of the, the different versions. Um, you, can, you can discuss them, so you can, uh, you can start discussing them um, and reply to people's comments and so on. Uh, but in this particular case, um, let me show the versioning real quickly. Uh, because I think that's a very necessary feature for academia. So let's say that I, I want to upload a different version of this. And so, so I'm just using a simple image right now in this example, but if you think about things like, um, like when you're working on a proposal with someone, um, being able to keep track of the changes is, is actually really, really useful. Um, and so at any point in time, you'll be able to, um, to sort of browse through the different, uh, the different versions for that content item. So when I go back now, um, so this second item that I uploaded is actually a PDF. And one of the things that you'll see is in the background, we've got something processing all of these, uh, pretty much all file types at this point. And so that'll generate a, something that we can show in the page. So you can actually look at the PDF, and I've deliberately picked a fairly complex one. Um, and you can see that it generates a high fidelity preview. And so this makes it very easy to sort of uh, discuss different documents, uh, look at them without having to download them, and so on and so on. Um, yeah. And so in this particular case, let me just, uh, so let's have a look at the commenting, for example. So I want to leave some feedback for, uh, for Brad to look at. I want to start some sort of discussion about this, uh, this thing that I shared with him. And so I prepared some text. Uh, usually you would just enter this. You wouldn't have this prepared. Uh, but it speeds it up a little bit. And so basically, you can just add that. It's all very simple to use, but there's a lot of things that you can do with that. So now I'll go back to, um, to my activity feed. Um, and basically, the recent activity gives you an overview of everything that's been, uh, that's been going on that's relevant to you. And that, this, this is a very important feature of the system, actually. This, this allows you to, to have a good understanding of what's going on. It gives you a good understanding of uh, what you need to be looking at, and basically, um, ensures that you won't lose anything or you won't miss anything. Um, and this is a hugely successful thing that people do tend to check quite a bit. Um, and so in this one, you'll see, um, you'll see all of the different things that we've done, but I'll, I'll go in as Brad now, the person that I shared it with, and it'll, it'll be a little bit more, um, there you'll be able to see how, how useful it really is. So I actually was already signed in as in, let me. So I'm, going into a different browser now. So I'm signing in as Brad, and basically he'll be able to see the different things that have happened. And the reason why he's able to see that is because those items were shared with him directly, um, were shared with him. No one else, because I, I made it private, will be, able to, will be able to see it. And again, this very quickly gives you a good idea of, of what's been happening, what's been going on. Um, and so if Brad wanted to go, oh, and one thing you'll see here is that you'll see this uh, the red three number at the top, which basically these are your notifications. That, those are the, the activities that we consider to be especially important for you to check. Um, and those, um, and so, so those include things like someone requesting to join a group of yours, someone sharing something with you directly, uh, someone replying to a comment you made, those sorts of things uh, we call out explicitly. Um, and you'll be able to see the things that have just happened. So let me very quickly go in. Um, Oops. And so he can see this PDF because it was shared with him dire directly. No one else would be able to see it. And then he could continue this discussion. He could continue uh, talking to Natalie. He could reply to something specific, she said. Um, let me do that as well. So he could reply to that, and so on and so on. And you'll, you'll be able to see that this, this is now reflected in, the, in this activity feed. OK, um, so that's a little bit about content. And, and there's just so many things that you can do with that. Um, and then there's the, there's the discussions as well. So you can have discussions with 
and you can invite people and groups into that. You can even have public discussions. Uh, I won't go too deep into this. Um, if you want to check it out, just, just play around with the system. Um, and then there's groups, and groups are very important. Um, so basically, um, what groups are are essentially lists of people. Um, and you can, it's a list of people that you can use to share items with, to invite them into discussions, uh, and so on and so on. So basically, anything that you can use a person for, uh, you can use a group for as well. And this is really powerful. And yes, groups can be members of groups, uh, for those that are wondering. And so each group will have its own, um, will have its own what we call a group space. And, and basically, this, this group space isn't necessarily where all of the collaboration happens. That's more on the content side and the discussion side. But this group space gives you a really good summary of what's been going on um, with that group of people. What's, uh, and so, so this makes it really easy to keep track uh, of things. Um, and so each group will have this activity feed. Each group will have a library where they can see uh, all of the content that's been shared with, um, with that group or the content that's been collaborated on with that group. Uh, there's all of the discussions that the, that the group has been having, and then you can see the different uh, group members and so on. So this is a very powerful concept. And I, when I was talking about um, if you want one concrete thing that you want to do, that you want to try the OE for, um, try project sites. And the groups pretty much uh, give you a better experience of it. Makes it a lot easier to keep track of what's going on. Gives you nice previews of everything. Um, gives you notifications, which we'll come back to, and so on and so on. So that, there's a lot you can do with this. It's very simple, but it's very powerful. Um, so let me do a few things here. So first of all, I'll, uh, as, as I'm making this smaller, you'll see that the OE is actually a perfectly responsive system. So it works really well on your mobile phone, on your tablet, uh, and so on. And so let me go ahead and actually, um, let me add Natalie to this group that I set up as, as Brad. And maybe I'll add her as a, as a member for this one. Right, that didn't work, but um, it's fine. Anyway, um, so in theory, um, so one of the things that the OE does as well, it gives you pretty much instant feedback. So when, when anything happens that's relevant to you, you'll be able to just see it come into your activity feed or it'll give you nice notifications. So it's a very, um, it's a very good system for doing that collaborative work uh, and so on. So one last thing that I'll show, I, I mean, there's just so many things and I can't show everything is the ability to, uh, to do collaborative documents. So let me make it a little bit uh, wider. Um, and basically, so let's say that for this particular uh, use case, we want to, we're about to have a meeting with someone at Cambridge University, um, and we want to keep some notes of, of, what, of what we're talking about during the meeting. Um, and so I could create a document, um, call it meeting notes, and Again, I, I get all of these options as to how public I want this to be. Let's say I want to keep it private, just make it available to the group. But I also want to bring in the person from Cambridge, John Norman, um, because that's the person we're going to have a talk with or we're having the call with. And so we want him to be able to, to see the notes as well, get to them, but we don't necessarily want to invite him into the group. And you have all of that flexibility. And what I just did is actually very significant because I invited John into this, into this document, John is in a different university, a different institution, which is a completely seamless experience. So that's very, very powerful. So let's go ahead and do that. So you'll see now that um, she can see that this, uh, the meeting notes documents has come up. And so I didn't have to do anything, it just showed up. And so in here you'll see, um, you'll see a collaborative editor, so you can work on, on on documents with people at the same time. And so when I, well, you'll see that all of this is real time. You'll be able to keep track of, um, of who made different changes. This is fully versioned, and so on and so on. And so there's a lot more there, but there's, um, hopefully you can by now see that there's many things that you can do with this, but this would work very well for project sites, as an example. So I'll stop the demo there. Um, I'll go back to things. Are there any questions about so far. Right, I'll keep going. Okay, so these are a set of updates as to what happened in the last year, and there's some, some really, really cool stuff that has happened. Um, a few quick things uh, in terms of who the, 
Uh, the institutions are beh behind this project, the institutions that are investing in this project. We have Georgia Tech and Marist College in the US, Cambridge University um, in the UK, and then we've got research as a commercial partner uh, in the UK as well. There's Essa Portai, uh, which is an association of over 70 French universities in France. And then this year, we also added the Independent Schools of Victoria as a stakeholder, which I think is a very interesting stakeholder. Um, it's a set of 214 independent schools in, um, in Victoria, Australia. Um, that's very good. There's been a ton of releases since last year's conference, uh, five major ones. There's been 10, uh, 10 smaller ones and then a whole bunch of patch releases, uh, all of which have been used in production. And so progress continues to be made there. These are a few examples of uh, features that have been added in the last year. Um, I actually couldn't fit, I couldn't fit any of them in my, in my demo, uh, but you'll get a quick overview here. So there's the uh, email notifications and preferences, so you can, you can specify how often and when you want to receive uh, email updates. So when something important happens, we, we will send you an email, be nicely formatted, have all of the information. You can, you can say, I want those immediately. I want to be able to know when I need to do something immediately, you can say I want a daily digest, I want a weekly digest, and, um, or you can just turn it off. Um, there's group profiles, so every group has now, has now got this. This is especially for uh, public groups or groups for your institution, discoverable groups, where you can sort of describe your group, you'll see some featured members and so on. So this makes it a lot more easy to, uh, for people to find out what the group is about um, and who's involved and so on, and they can then get involved. Um, this is a more technical one, but we now have full, uh, full documented REST API documentation. Um, so all of this, so this is basically what the user interface uses as well, and if you wanted to do any sort of integration, it's all there for you to play with, it's all interactive, it's all documented, um, and so on. And actually we've got some examples where people are using these APIs, like the STEM incubator in Georgia, um, to, to interact or bring stuff out of the system into something else. So there are some really good examples there. Uh, folder support, which I didn't show at all. Folders are essentially their collections in which you can uh, group and curate uh, content items. Um, and you can actually, so nothing's really bound to a context in the OE. So when you do something in a group, you can actually, you can take it out or you can, um, you can include another group. And the same is true for folders. So content isn't bound to a folder. You can, you can actually remix, repurpose, and so on. Um, and that's been a really important feature, the folders. Uh, this we did see, this is the better collaborative editor. I don't know if you, if you saw the demo last year, but we've done a ton of work on this. Looks a lot more seamless now. It looks, looks better integrated. Um, this is essentially a, a skin that improved version of, of Etherpad, uh, but it, it works a lot better now, I think. Uh, there's a configurable tenant uh, homepage, and so the, the homepage that I showed is the, uh, during the demo, that's the default one. But as an institution, you can go in and you can reconfigure that entirely, depending on, on how you want to present yourself as an institution, how you want to position the system uh, at your institution. Uh, and you can brand it and skin it completely. Uh, none of this requires developer intervention. It's all pretty much, uh, it's, it's all easy to do through the administration UI. And there's been many, many, many more uh, additions. There's just too many to list them all. Okay, quick note about accessibility. Um, we've done a fair amount of accessibility work this year. So we actually had a, an, a full external accessibility review which was carried out by, by WebAIM, uh, which I think is the same uh, organization that Sakai will be using for their uh, review as well. Um, they produced a report uh, where they reported all of the issues that they found. There were a number of priority one issues, priority two issues, three and four. Um, we've already fixed all of the priority one issues. We're almost fixed all of the priority two issues. Um, and we are currently on our way to getting a, um, a WCAG 2.0 AA certification. Um, and if you want to read a little bit more about that, we have a blog post about this work. It links to the full report, everything's open, um, list, lists all of the issues that they, that they identified, um, and, then, and then we've got updates on which ones have been fixed already as well. A little bit about internationalization. Um, we actually have really good um, internationalization support, and we've got a lot of uh, contributed, uh, contributed translations already. And one of my, the fastest translator is actually in the room. He will translate stuff within the hour that we put it on there, um, which is Frederick. Um, so these are all of the languages that we have translations in. I think this shows a little bit, uh, this gives you some insight as to 
uh, that there is some community around this. Um, and so we've got full translations for many of these, partial translations for others. Um, and this, and we, we're always looking for people to uh, either help maintain translations, help keep them complete, uh, or start a new one if you, if you wanted to. Again, this is very easy to do. Um, we've got this Crowdin, which is an external tool page where you can basically, as anyone, you don't have to have any technical skills, you can just go in there and start translating into, uh, into any language. Okay, um, so this is where I think it becomes really interesting. So I think, I think all of the new features that will be in Sakai 11 are really, really cool. I think the announcement that the JISC in the UK will be using the learning analytics initiative software um, for a nationwide service is awesome. But I think this is actually the coolest bit in the entire conference. And I, I invite you to give this a little bit of thought when you, leave, when you leave this session and you leave this conference, just as to how awesome this really is. So from software to service. Um, so what about your institution? How can you get started? How can you get involved? Um, and so we're a fully open source Aperio project. You can do the standard thing, which is download yourself. And we actually have a few, and download and run yourself. And we have, in fact, some have chosen to do that. We've got our French, uh, French partners that have chosen to deploy their own uh, instance, and they currently have 11 uh, French universities on there. And that's absolutely fine. But what, what can we do as a project to break down some of the barriers towards entry um, on a technical level? But also, once we, once we bring this original vision of a global community where people can, actually, can very seamlessly share across institutions, what can we do as a project to help break down the, bar the walls between institutions? And this is where Unity comes into the picture. What is Unity? So Unity is a, uh, is a hosted service of the OE software. And it's actually, that's actually a joint effort between the OE project, the, op the OE open source project, and research uh, a commercial organization. And we are hosting, a, we are hosting this production-ready environment uh, together, which I think is unique in, in open source. And, and this is basically, if you were in my session last year, uh, we showed that, we had, that the project was providing a hosted environment for institutions to use. This is basically a continuation of that. Uh, it just makes it a lot more mature. And the details of this, this partnership are really interesting, I think, and really powerful. Um, and so, so we've got a, a partnership agreement between the two parties, and there's three different options in there for your institution as to how you can start using the OE. Um, and I think, that, again, this is really, this is really powerful. Um, the first option is that you can get an institutional tenant, a tenant for your institution, for free. Um, at that point, you won't get a, an SLA or a data processing agreement, and there will be a reasonable use policy. But you can get it for free, and which basically means that you can get started straight away. So we're starting to, to take down some of the barriers there that usually exist. Option two is when you want, uh, you can get an institutional tenant with an SLA and a data processing agreement um, and all of the support around that. Um, at that point, you will be charged at cost. This is basically just the cost of providing the environment to you, which will be, which will be very uh, economical. Um, on top of this, uh, there will be a 20% contribution towards uh, towards the OE uh, towards OE development and, for, and maintenance, um, and so this is part of where um, where this partnership also also serves as a sustainability strategy for the project. Option number three is to become a strategic OE project stakeholder or partner, just like Marist and Georgia Tech and other institutions, um, and help contribute to the direction of the project. In exchange for that, you will get a free SLA. Um, and, and a free data processing agreement and a free tenancy, um, just, like, just like option two, which you can use for your institution in exchange for that. All of that, when you become a strategic OE project partner, all of that investment goes into the OE project itself for further design, development, and maintenance. And if you want to read the details of this, of this partnership agreement, you can find that on our website. So if you think about this, this is really, really interesting. So this we are trying to offer this environment to your institution in basically, it's basically in the most efficient way that you can, you can realistically do it. Um, and it helps contribute to the sustainability of the project. 
and I think this is a really interesting model. This is, this is a very new model for open source. It's definitely something um, that we want to keep thinking about or looking at in the future. Um, so that's one. We've already broken down quite a few barriers there. But what can we do as a project to, even, to, to remove even more barriers? That's where the access management federations come in. And so basically most countries have an access management, a shibboleth access management federation, which uh, sort of um, arrange for, um, for access to different platforms through your single sign-on systems. And so what we've done as a, as a project, as a, as, a, as a Unity service, is basically we've become a member of many of these access management federations, and we're in the process of becoming a member uh, of even more of them. Um, and so, so once, we, once we got in there, what we did is we've, create, we've automatically created uh, tenancies for all of the institutions in those access management federations, and we've automatically configured them to work with their single sign-on system. Um, and that basically means that there's, there's no barrier left there. We can, um, you can get a tenancy that's configured with your single sign-on system in basically no time. So you can start using it straight away. This is the map that I showed last year. This was for the environment that the project at the time was hosting and which has continued to become the Unity service. Um, and so this was, this, these were the tenancies that we had last year, which was, and it was a reasonable number. It was about 30 of them. Um, I actually was still able to put the logos on there, which, was, uh, which made it look more impressive. Um, but this year, I couldn't do that anymore. Um, there, were just, there were just too many tenancies there, and I had to revert back to Google Maps. Um, and Google Maps gives us this. So this doesn't have any of the logos. There, w there's about uh, just under 400 tenancies that we have today. Not all of them are active, but they're all ready to be used. Um, they're all pre-configured with SSO, and all of these people have access to it. And this is starting to open up tremendous possibilities, I think, for, uh, for collaboration. I'm going to go back to yesterday's, um, yesterday's keynote talk once more, where he had these two slides where infrastructure has to be relatively inexpensive and has to provide broad permissions. And I think the OE is doing that here. Um, you can get the OE very, very cheaply, um, or even for free if you want. Um, so it's, it's become very inexpensive, gives you broad permissions. Uh, as an institution, you own all of your data, all of your tenancy data. And there's a lot of remixing and repurposing features in the OE anyway. Um, and so innovation thrives when the cost and obs obstacles to experimenting are low. And I think that's, what, that's exactly what we've done here. Um, we, are, we have gone out of the way. The technology has gone out of the way. It's now up to, it's now up to the people at your, in, at your university to start doing real innovation with this platform. And that's why this is the right time for your institution to join in this environment as well. This is the website of the service. Is William still here? I can't see him. <laughs> okay, so on this, uh, on this website, you'll find a little bit more information about the service that we're offering. We're working on updating our OE project website as well to, uh, to reflect some of these, some of these things. Um, if you're interested in, in having, experimenting with an institutional tenant, then there's, there's some ways of contacting us um, and there's some additional information there. But I hope that you can see the real power of this and how, how many of the barriers have been taken away here. Thanks. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Not currently, but it, it's something that we'd be open to discussing. Yeah. Oh, he was asking if any institutions have configured the library to work with their institutional box or Google Apps account, I guess. Um, so that's not something that we've done yet. Um, we have actually been looking at Google Apps integration for quite a while now. Um, and one of the reasons why we want to encourage institutions to come in is to, is to help us drive these, these use cases. And once it becomes a priority, we can look at it. Sure. 
So Josh's question is, what brought you out here? <laughs> we think what you're doing is pretty cool. Like you, you've been very persistent at it with a very clear vision. So it's actually quite amazing to see it. And you have a distribution model in place now, which is good. Really good. Nico, do you have any do you have any examples that you can share of the real world collaboration across the distribution boundaries between researchers who are currently Yeah, I do actually. Um, but I was hoping that William would be here because that was what he was presenting on. Um, so, so there was a session yesterday on where four institutions gave examples of how they're using it. Um, I think we've got some really good examples in, in France, for example. Um, and so I, I would recommend you to go to the next session, which is ESSA presenting. They've got, they've got different, um, different examples of where institutions that need to work together across, like there's the, the student ID project where they coordinate student ID distribution uh, across, many, across many institutions. And so, so they've been using the OEE to do that cross-institutional uh, collaboration, which I thought was a really cool one. Um, and, but there's, there's a lot more examples there. Um, we'll, we're currently working on publishing some of these use cases, on, and that'll be part of the new OEE website as well. Right. Yeah, so, so we've got different types of tenants as well. It's not just universities. So there's one for default, which is an academic uh, community, of in, community of interest for, for fashion. Um, there's the STEM incubator, which is around uh, connecting, uh, connecting STEM teachers in the state of Georgia across schools. Um, we've got one for an academic community of educators, uh, which basically tries to um, once people that are trained to become a teacher, once they leave, instit once they leave their institution, they'll uh, they'll stay in that in that environment to to uh, continue conversations with their peers and so on, and to, to continue doing uh, development. Uh, and there, like the Aperio is using it uh, as an organization for board work and for incubation work. And there's just so many uh, interesting examples in which people could use it and, and how they could set this up. So currently not. So currently there's no integration. Um, one of the things on our roadmap is to provide a, a group provider, basically. Uh, so something that, you, that would allow you to point you to something like group or, or something else and, and sync the group memberships and the, the list of groups. Uh, but that's currently not there. Uh, yeah, I mean, so the pricing is basically the three options that I gave. You either get a tenancy for institution without SLA data processing agreement, then you can just use it. Um, and then the other one is, is at cost, so that it depends on your usage. Um, it'll actually be, um, and we, we don't have anyone that signed up to that yet. We've only launched it last week. Um, and then as soon as we've got a few, we'll, we'll have more concrete numbers. But the, I mean, the number's going to be low anyway. Um, All right, thank you.